Well, there are other things going on too, because there's twister theory. Now you see, that's, I don't usually talk about it in interviews because it's a bit hard to explain. But that's an idea which I had a lot of people working on when I was, it, my uh, graduate students, I had a lot of graduate students, and many of them worked on twister theory, which gives a different, different point of view of how to do, view physics, if you like. See, usually we think of space-time, and space is three dimensions, and then time is another one. So you've got this space-time, which is a four-dimensional structure. And the basic thing it's made of are these little points. We call them events, you see. No, no dimension in space, no dimension in time. They blip, you see, like that. Those are the points in space-time, or the events. Now, you see, in twister theory, that's not the basic structure. The basic thing is basically well, something like a photon. It's, it goes along with the speed of light, and you can identify the points because you have a family of them going through that point. It's, sort of t it t it's a kind of geometry which turns the ordinary way of looking at physics inside out. Some things are more difficult to do, some things are a lot easier to do. And what's a lot easier is to describe fields like the Maxwell field for radiation, for the gravitational field. In fact, gravitational field... Well, there's a story here, you see. Photons can spin left-handed or right-handed. And you can describe the wave function of a left-handed one or a right-handed one. And usually you add them together because they both spins combine together to give you the linear polarizations, the things that in your polarized glasses you have. They let the light through one way and not the other way. And these add, you add two right-handed and left-handed together to get the linear polarized. Then there are different ways of doing it. Anyway, that's the way photons work. Now we see in twister theory, it's very peculiar. You have a, two different formulae, one which works for the right-handed and one which works for the left-handed. And for the gravitons, that is the particle of gravity, if you like, again, you do this. But you see, with gravity, <coughs> you want to make it fit in with Einstein's theory, so it changes space. Space-time is changed by the gravity. And then you find you can do it, and you can do it for the left-handed ones, but not for the right-handed ones. And this was a great puzzle to me, because well, twister theory has got a twist to it, so it's left and right are not quite the same in the theory. And you can do the left-handed ones and not the right-handed ones. And I used to call this the googly problem, because in cricket, you see, you ball a cricket ball, and if it spins, what's a thing called a leg break? And if it spins left-handed, that's a leg break. And if you're very clever, not many people can do it, you can make it spin looking as though it's got left-handed, but actually spins right-handed. And that's what's called a googly. So we call this the googly problem, because you're trying to get the right-handed graviton in the framework which does the left-handed one. And that was a stumbling block which took about 40 years. <laughs> and only fairly recently, I had an idea with some help from Michael Atiyah, who I've got ideas from quite often. And uh, I had sort of part of the idea, and I can quite understand the other part, which he explained. And uh, even then, it took another five years to make it work. But I think it works. So this is a way of describing physics in this unusual way. And, and if you can spin both the right and la left, you can do also the, <coughs> the particle interactions, the, the strong interactions and the weak interactions, and you can put the right and the left together. And I, I haven't done any of this, but it's a potential way of looking at physics in a completely different way. Well, some of it's been looked at already. People have, people have picked up on twister theory but not on this latest idea. They use it for scattering problems, for massless particles and things, but not to the extent that this would be a, a global theory which you'd be able to translate physics into this other language. And it has sort of features which uh, appeal to me very much. One of them is the use of complex numbers. You see, usually people think of numbers or the integers, one, two, three, four, or fractions, which are seven over five or whatever it is, or real numbers, which you write by decimal, which goes off to infinity, really. So you t tend to think of physics in terms of real numbers. They're called real numbers. They're not real in the ordinary sense of real, but well, they're real, but they're no more real than some other kinds of numbers. But the things called imaginary numbers or complex numbers are things where you're allowed to take the square root of minus one. And that's the key thing. You're allowed to have a thing you call i, and that's the square root of minus one. Once you put that into it, you have a whole new 
well, not that new, it was <laughs> many centuries ago when the idea was introduced, but it's a whole different way of looking at the world. And the thing about it is quantum mechanics already looks at the world that way. Quantum mechanics, the states in quantum mechanics, involve these complex numbers. So the idea is that you bring that kind of complex number geometry into the real world and the classical world and it's somehow the quantum and classical get all mixed up and it's a different way of looking at things and there's very beautiful mathematics in the complex world if you like which you don't see in the real world and it's and it's uh, something which when I was an undergrad a mathematics undergraduate I was absolutely stunned by the magic that there is in these complex complex number means it's got a real number and imaginary number together in the same number. And the algebra and the analysis and all that stuff and the geometry of these numbers has an elegance which you don't see in the real number geometry. So it always struck me as, you know, wouldn't it be nice if somehow that was what governed the world? And that's what Twister Theory does. It gives you a complex number picture, real and imaginary together picture of the world which involves quantum ideas as well as classical ones. But the new idea where the googly problem seems to be solved, I haven't had a chance to, to look at it very seriously. So that's your next challenge? Yeah, that's the next problem, yes. When I, when I give up on cosmology, well I don't know, I can do them both at once. But there's so many new things in the cosmology that need to be thought about. For more debates, talks and interviews, Subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.